going to get a little creative destruction of medicine going. But before I do that, I do want to know, I have a sense about this group, and that is how many of you are active on Twitter here? Yeah, very high percentage. That, that kind of fits in with your futuristic uh, into the digital world. That's great. So um, if you're into the digital world, can you tell me um, about this forklift that's lifting up the first hard drive computer onto the plane? What year was that? Anybody? Okay, 1956. And what uh, was the capacity of this hard drive? Now, five, five megabytes. Okay, so then we go to another very important technology, the first cell phone, uh, 40 years ago. And this was just brought back, uh, actually this evening uh, is being published, the current New Yorker. Uh, and this is uh, Obama with the original cell phone uh, with uh, Secretary Sebelius and a floppy drive. I haven't seen one of those in a long time. Um, and so the digital world hasn't intersected too, so far yet with medicine and actually isn't doing too well with the government, at least for this project. Um, and so we're going to get into uh, how we can change that. Obviously, little devices have taken over. And in fact, um, I, I, as I see everybody with their little devices, I start to wonder uh, what were these people doing when there weren't little devices? Uh, and in fact, uh, they've transformed our lives. And wait till they come become wireless medical devices, as uh, Walter uh, is leading the charge with the uh, Scout device. So back uh, when Walter Isaacson published uh, Steve Jobs' book, there was a notable quote in there that really, uh, uh, coming from a visionary, uh, or visioneer, uh, and that is the biggest innovation of the 21st century, from Steve Jobs' uh, perspective, will be the intersection of biology and technology. And that's what this is about, bringing the digital world into medicine and biology. So today we practice medicine at a population level. And it's uh, remarkably wasteful and also uh, makes for lots of errors. Uh, and that's, for example, mass screening. Did you know that, for example, mammography leads to net harm in women? And did you know, for example, that we supposed to have colonoscopies, all of us after age 50, but only one in um, 20 or less will ever develop colon cancer. So why would you have to go through that horrible procedure? And what about giving the same medicine to all people with the same diagnosis, even at the same dose? That's population medicine. And now we finally have the tools to take this to the individual level. And that's what's really so exciting. And so average is over, which is the way we looked at patients still today as patient averages, how we give a drug based on a clinical trial, uh, and uh, that's the average method. And that fortunately is over or getting to be over soon in medicine. Because what we have today is the geographic information system, like a Google map or like any way you can uh, superimpose multiple layers of information spatially, temporally, geographically, and we now have that for human beings. We didn't have that before. And so, if you look at this uh, GIS of human being, you see we have a social graph, we have biosensors, uh, imaging capabilities, and then all these different omics. In fact, you could call it panoramic. Uh, that is everything from DNA sequencing uh, to gene expression to metabolomics, microbiome, uh, the epigenome, and the exposome, exposome, that is our environment. So let's just uh, get into a, a little bit of this uh, uh, GAS, uh, this digitized human being, and start off for just for a second about the fact that there are sensors uh, more than head to toe. There's an inundation of biosensors, and I I'm not going to get into all these. Uh, obviously, you see Daniel and many others are walking around with Google Glass, and there are so many uh, sensors. That's not the, the topic uh, for this evening, uh, but I did want to just mention not just that there are so many, and that, of course, Walter's uh, the Scanadu company is uh, certainly producing one of the ones in this picture. But uh, in fact, this one caught my eye this past week. And this was the Aero uh, wristband. And it says it can do optical spectroscopy to measure all the calories that you're taking in. And so I thought it was kind of interesting. It's from three uh, uh, guys at the University of Waterloo, which is a respected, highly respected university up in Canada. So I actually tweeted about that, and I said, can a wristband 
wouldn't it be great if we had a sensor that did this, accurately track caloric intake? And I had a question mark, a wavelength of light shine on your blood through this wristband detecting metabolites, it seemed a little odd. I quickly got a response from Aero Health. And it says, hi Eric, we can. We got prototypes and data to show this and a polished demo coming soon. Can I send you proof? I said, sure, send me proof. And so they sent me proof. Now, I don't know if it's the final proof, but it's interesting to see that you could get through their methods, uh, to, uh, have 170 calories on a, on a uh, package and have their measurements come in pretty close. And then here you see an individual with uh, different meals and junk foods for dinner, and you see this tracking, which is quite interesting. Well, I don't know whether it's really going to be validated, but it's an interesting concept. And we just published about this just a little over a week ago in JAMA, Can Mobile Health Technologies Transform Healthcare? And Steve Steinhubel, Evan Muse, and I wrote about this various M Health technologies from the perspectives of acute care, chronic care, uh, clinicians, and consumers. And our main conclusion was, like with this Aero Health, um, M, M Health technologies have the potential to change every aspect of the healthcare environment and to do so while delivering better outcomes and substantially lowering costs. That's fantastic, great. But most critically needed is real world uh, clinical trial evidence. So that's what we need to work on with the device I just mentioned and hundreds more because the innovation in this space is truly remarkable. Now I want to go to the next level of biosensors um, and Walter kind of introduced this and it was uh, this caption uh, you say, well, that kind of seems a little odd about the gallbladder light uh, coming on. So uh, what I'd like to do is show you a project we've been working on just briefly uh, because we have uh, over 400 sensors embedded in our cars, virtually almost any modern car. And we have over 10 sensors in our smartphones, but we have no sensors embedded in our body. And so not wearable, we're talking about embedded in the body. And so, um, we, at the same time, we have this remarkable problem about heart attacks and strokes. And we can't detect them temporally when they're going to happen. That is, in the days or weeks before a heart attack or stroke happens. And the numbers are staggering. Still the leading cause of death and disability, numbers one and number three uh, in this country and most of the Western world. So, you'll recall Tim Russert, who died uh, at age uh, 58, and James Danolfini, who died at age 51, both of massive heart attacks. Both had had workups, including for uh, Tim Russert, a stress test that was normal just a few weeks before a fatal heart attack. And the whole point is that we can't predict them because the stress testing that we do today only picks up tight narrowings, whereas what causes a heart attack are mild narrowings that are actually quite uh, pervasive. And so being able to know that a plaque is inflamed, is about to rupture, is a big unmet medical need. So we put a lot of attention into this, and at, at Scripps, at the Research Institute, at Scripps Health, all throughout San Diego, we've been collecting the blood from the early minutes of heart attack in hundreds of individuals over the last few years. And we've been able to detect in the first few minutes of a heart attack these very bizarre multinucleated cluster endothelial cells that have been shed from the area of the uh, crack in the artery. And so that's exciting because now we've done genomics of these cells, sequenced them, and uh, learned about the biology of these cells uh, at a, an extraordinary level. And so now what we've done is couple that information with a sensor, that's a nanosensor that's injectable, uh, is built at uh, Caltech through Axel Scherer and colleagues. And so now we can pick up a, and have a heart attack ringtone, potentially, theoretically, uh, because we can pick up this genomic signal uh, in the blood and that can be relayed uh, to the chip uh, to a cell phone signal. So I recently um, introduced this to uh, Colbert. Can we get the volume up? Uh, maybe you need to go back and get some audio. Before and give you a heart attack okay. ringtone on your phone to warn you, prevent the heart attack. Really? Yes. That was yes. Now, this information. I'm sure that it's going to come down the line that, that, that you know, the insurance companies will say, hey, this will give you a cut if you have a monitor on you so we, you know, we can right. stay healthier. But then they're going to sell that information about your present health to other people. And I'm going to get like a ringtone that says, would you like 20% off on caskets? <laughs> You know, like, or, or Crestor or something like that. It's coming. It's coming. 
So he's pretty quick, as you know. Actually, the fastest uh, comedian I've ever met. And uh, he picked up on something very important, which are these digital breadcrumbs uh, from our mobile phones. And this uh, brings me to a uh, cartoon. The boy says, <laughs> Dad says you're monitoring all our phone calls. Obama says, he's not your dad. <laughs> um, so it's great to have all this information, uh, but then we have uh, other issues. Now, um, I did want to mention, though, that that isn't unique to heart attacks. If you have a blood under surveillance all the time, you can pick up things like autoantibodies to the islet cells in the pancreas. And you have five years to work with in a child who has a high genomic risk of developing uh, type 1 diabetes. Or you could do the same with cell-free tumor DNA. It's in the plasma, particularly in a patient with known cancer, to track that person on a continuous basis. So we have a lot of things we can do with smartphones and embedded sensors in the future, which as I think is quite exciting and part of this GIS of a human being. Now let's move to imaging, because this is of course a very uh, exciting area because we have uh, imaging capabilities now that transcend anything we might have uh, imagined was possible. And so back to Colbert, he had had a perforated eardrum and I was able to use the cell scope uh, to convert the smartphone to an otoscope to examine what, while he had this diving accident, his perforated eardrum during that uh, visit. So let's uh, get the audio up this time. Okay. You had an eardrum. Yeah, I was diving, I blew out my good eardrum. I, I thought I could just take a look with the smartphone into your eardrum. Is that all right? Okay, yeah, sure. I'll just stand, I'll stand. <laughs> no, really? stay right there. Okay. All right. So, um, so basically, I put this right in here. Yeah. And I hope I don't hurt you. Oh, no, I hope so too. <laughs> Ow. Did that hurt? No. Okay. And uh, I've got your eardrum. Uh huh. Right there. It's an eardrum, it's not my ass. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> By the way, could I get a colonoscopy with this thing? <laughs> The, the scariest part about, what, about that was the next day, two patients called my office to schedule a smartphone colonoscopy. <laughs> help, help me. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the stethoscope. Uh, back actually when Tedman was here in 09, I said we don't need a stethoscope to listen to the heart anymore. I haven't used one since. Uh, but they're still around, and unfortunately, they're not a stethoscope since 1816. This is a stethophone. You can't see anything with this. You can only listen to things like Love Dub. And this is uh, a relic, but most physicians have not yet acknowledged that, but you can get images of the heart in seconds, which we validated and uh, published about, which are as good as a $350,000 uh, echo machine in the hospital. So this is huh, not moving, but these are images of the heart. Um, and this is, of course, a sick person's heart with dilated chambers. You can see everything about the heart in just seconds, and it's really a big advance, and it's not just for the a heart, it's for the abdomen, it's for the fetus, for the carotids, all sorts of things should be part of the bedside exam. And that's part, again, of digitizing human beings uh, through a, 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 a tiny device the size of a smartphone. Uh, hmm. So one of the things we need to do is, of course, have major surgery on medical education, as one a recent op-ed uh, captured. And as I've been trying to advocate, why are we dissecting cadavers? Why aren't medical students dissecting their own genomes? Because we're ready for that, which is the segue to this last thing I wanted to get into, and that is per perhaps the one that will transcend the most of, uh, of Know Thyself, and that's uh, the, all the different omics, this panoramic view. Okay, so today, unfortunately, the medical profession and the uh, public at large sees DNA testing like this, like this truck that drives around, who's your daddy, you know, that kind of thing. And we need to get over that. That's not really what this has, the value that it has. Uh, so uh, one of the things, you know, Ray, Raymond McKay touched on this earlier, but I think it's really something to emphasize. This is the biggest technologic jump in the history of humankind. And now I'm not talking about Moore's Law, which obviously changed the world. I'm talking about the cost of sequencing, which outstripped Moore's Law, actually by multiple log orders in the recent years. So that's really remarkable, but when you think about what's going on 
in the same space, healthcare is going in the opposite direction. So it hasn't yet been able to leverage either Moore's law or sequencing to make for healthcare to be at lower cost and more uh, efficient and precise. So what I want to do in these uh, closing minutes is to take you through the pre-womb to tomb. And basically what we have is a problem. We have so much knowledge in genomics that could be applied in everyday medicine, which we're not using. And it's really sobering, and we have to get out of that. Part of that is medical, medical education. Part of that is engagement with the public. So let's just go through this timeline. I'm not going to go through all of it, but just touch on a few salient uh, points uh, along the timeline. So first about planning a baby. What's amazing is the carrier rates that we have are very high. Things like uh, spinal muscle atrophy, one in 35 of us carry, or ataxia telangiectasia, one in 100. So cystic fibrosis, one in 40 of us carry this. And fragile X, and many, many others. And they can be screened now. 23andMe has 50 of these available with their $99 test. Council has over 100, and Gene Peaks has about 1,000 different variants in their testing. Uh, so the point is, is that why don't couples all do this so they can plan? And in fact, uh, what is interesting about Gene Peaks, they can even do uh, simulations. They're doing simulations with genomic variants, and they've even uh, set up a contract with the, one of the large uh, sperm banks in Manhattan, Cryobank, to do uh, uh, genomic screening of sperm to sort out for de novo mutations and for recessive alleles. But this is the ultimate preventive medicine, but it is hardly being used. Let's now go on to prenatal diagnosis. And this is from a Wired piece. This simple blood test at 8 to 10 weeks of a pregnant uh, woman, maternal blood sample, which picks up the fetal DNA uh, you can actually sequence the whole fetal genome from a tube of blood from the mother. And it's a revolution in prenatal medicine. It's amazing, there are lots of obstetricians that are not even aware of this, no less the consumers. And so this is just a, a New Yorker cartoon, uh, ultrasound of a baby, and I, the question, what, what was the caption? I thought the caption was future data scientist. I uh, thought that might work well here. We need a lot more of them, of course. But the whole point about this is that uh, we have four tests now that can do this blood sampling, uh, and they're listed here. And now we're getting to the point where almost 100,000 of millions of women who are uh, pregnant this year are having these uh, tests. And that's a step in the right direction. And the tests are remarkably accurate, 99.5, 99.8% uh, sensitive and specific. And moreover, they're replacing amniocentesis, which carries a risk and is considerably more expensive. And beyond that, it's not just for diagnosis of trisomies and aneuploidy, but also you could do a lot more with this information uh, when people are ready for it. But obviously, we're, we're still uh, grappling with getting uh, the basics here. But our daughter, uh, we're expecting our first grandchild, and she uh, recently had uh, one of these tests, and it was very reassuring not just to get uh, the information about the gender of the baby, but moreover to find that she had no uh, trisomies of uh, 18, 13, 21, and that's done so early in pregnancy, and it's great to have that kind of information. So let's go uh, zoom forward to the newborn. You know, the HEAL test is notoriously done in most states when most babies are born, and that takes days to weeks to get back information like, for example, phenylketonuria. But as it turns out, we can do a whole lot better than that. And in fact, uh, Nature recently said, uh, the day when all children will be sequenced at birth, if not before, draws even nearer. So we can, and there are five centers that just got a major NIH grant in the US to do sequencing at birth, instead of a heel stick, and get immediate information within 24 hours of whole exome or whole genome sequencing. Now, uh, earlier, Raymond touched on undiagnosed disease. He mentioned the Nicholas Volker uh, uh, famous case of a, the first boy whose life was saved through sequencing. But I just want to talk about this a little bit further because idiopathic diseases, the fancy medical term for we don't know. Why don't we just say we don't know? No, we don't do that. So we don't know. Um, they, the idios uh, is personal. Separate, distinct, the pathic is suffering a condition. Recently on Twitter, I saw another uh, definition of idiopathic. 
um, only means that the patient is pathological and the doctor is an idiot. <laughs> okay, now, why is this such a big deal right now? You know, there's millions of people that have an undiagnosed condition. And they're not all kids. A lot of adults are walking around with a serious undiagnosed condition and spend a lot of money going from one medical center to the next. And this is just in one example of a boy who had had multiple workups, uh, uh, and uh, he was part of this study that was just published uh, from Baylor in Texas. 250 uh, individuals, a lot of them were pediatric, a lot of them neurologic. They had a one in four success rate for making the diagnosis through sequencing, exome sequencing. But what's particularly interesting is that 97% of these were insured, uh, insurers paid for the sequencing. So that represents a big jump forward that we're starting to get into medical sequencing era. So I wanted to tell you, um, this has a mind of its own, I wanted to tell you about the first family we encountered. We have a program like the one at Baylor, uh, where we've actually had 15 families of over 100 that we've screened who we've sequenced, trios. Here in the case, Lily Grossman and her parents, Steve and Gay. And Lily is 16 years old, confined to a wheelchair, cognitively intact, but she actually has uh, many other neurologic uh, deficits, including uh, problems, serious problems with tremor, uh, with sleep, voice, and other matters. So uh, she was taken uh, by her parents to all these very well-known medical centers. Not just once, but many times. And over the course of years, cumulatively had bills well over one and a half million dollars left without a diagnosis. And so we then enrolled her in our, actually our first family in our protocol uh, uh, called Idiom, and we um, actually sequenced Lily and her parents. And Ali Torquemani in our group uh, was able to go through the bioinformatics, which Raymond touched on, which is a complex task. But I won't take you through all that at this hour of the evening. But the main point is, through a lot of work, uh, through millions of variants uh, in Lily's genome, uh, anchored by her parents and the reference genomes, the diagnosis was made. The molecular diagnosis of Lily's condition that had not been known for 16 years was finally known. And what this has done is set up a treatment based on that knowledge. And also what's fascinating is when Ali presented this case at the recent American Society of Human Genetics, there were two more cases that came forward from people in the audience. Uh, and now there's four cases from this particular molecular diagnosis. That's what happens when you start cracking unknown diseases. And in fact, Lily is a lot better, not normal by any means, but we're still working on it. A lot of her neurologic conditions are improved. So just to go forward, a couple other points along the way uh, about, uh, for example, you heard about Raymond saying he had a risk of macular degeneration, but there are rare variants for macular degeneration that raise the risk up to 23-fold. And there are many preventive things that can be done for this condition. The more we sequence millions of people in the future and with the varied conditions and with some family members, we're going to learn about all these rare, low-frequency variants that carry very high risk, very high penetrance. So for example, one of the problems we have, cystic fibrosis, which has been known, this gene discovered by Francis Collins in 1989. There's 2,000 variants in this gene, and we don't know how many are functional or not functional still today. It's still the case for BRCA1 and 2. There, we don't, there's so many mutations and variants in the gene, and only through years of work and multiple people, sequence, and families can we sort all this out. So that's why I want to present you this concept, that we're not ready yet to be able to understand each person's genome. But basically, when uh, we have the cost of sequencing continues to ratchet down, and the line crosses with the numbers of individuals, millions, who are sequenced with varied phenotypes, we eventually get to a point where it really is informative and really carries remarkable value. We're probably a, at least a few years away from that. And there are people, the early adopters, who are getting their uh, whole genome sequence. I've done it. Esther, you've probably done it. Many people have done it. The point being is that it doesn't provide nearly as much information. It's the same sequence but it doesn't provide nearly as much information as it will in a few years. So let's just go to a couple other examples of enormous knowledge that we have today, which is not necessarily being applied uh, at scale. So for infectious diseases, we can use sequencing of the pathogen, in this case tuberculosis, to not only pinpoint uh, where the epidemic outbreak came from, 
but also to be able to uh, track it and to, uh, to negate it. Uh, and, and in fact, in this case, it was actually combined with uh, social network analysis. But this has been now applied for C. difficile, for Staph aureus, that is MRSA, and for Klebsiella pneumonia. So being able to diagnose a pathogen, just think today. We have to send for blood cultures. We give all sorts of antibiotic coverage for days. This can be done in the future through rapid sequencing, uh, including being able to detect the antibiotic re that's responsive uh, in that individual to the pathogen. And so this is going to change the way infectious diseases are handled. Cancer is a genomic disease. It does interact with our environment, but it is specifically genomic disease. And we have to evolve the way we think about it. And in fact, that's happening very fast. And in fact, there's a uh, government-sponsored cancer genome atlas, which has got 12 of the major cancers where thousands of individuals have had their tumor sequenced and their germline native DNA sequenced, and then have had uh, what you could call as a GIS uh, of, uh, of cancer, of tumor. And so this is what it looks like. You not only have the mutations from sequencing, the gene expression, the epigenomics, that is a DNA methylation, microRNAs, proteins, and all the clinical data for each individual. And what you can then do is start to understand what are, hmm, what are the pathways, okay, I guess that one's zap, uh, the pathways that are responsible for cancer. And it turns out there's less than 200 genes that when they're mutated, uh, oncogenes that drive cancer or tumor suppressor genes that when they go off the track, they allow cancer to happen. And so we're really zooming in on a relatively limited number of genes that can be the drivers of cancer. And that's from Bert Vogelstein and his group at Johns Hopkins. And we now know the 12 distinct pathways by which cancer takes hold. So we've made tremendous advances in understanding the biology of cancer. But there's one thing holding us back uh, that is uh, noteworthy, and that is depending on how you sample the cancer, it changes from one piece to the next, and so there's a lot of heterogeneity at the primary site, the metastatic site, and this is, of course, making it much more complex. It's hard enough to sequence tumor and germline DNA, but when you have to add multiple samples, that makes it particularly tricky. There is a company now that's now the only one out there that's trying to provide a service, and it only sequences, this is just recently published a week ago Sunday, 287 genes that have been associated with cancer. And they validated this in this publication couple thousand patients. And they do it very accurately, that is the sequencing, and they claim that they find a lot of driver mutations. So that's a step in the right direction. But it doesn't include the native person's germline DNA, so you don't know what really went off the track. And it doesn't have much of the genome. As it turns out, not only is it focused on the, the uh, part of the genome which is encoding proteins, and only a limited swath of that, but it doesn't capture anything about the rest of the genome. 98.5% of our genome has nothing to do with coding proteins. And the more we look there, the more we're finding that's where a lot of cancer is being driven. So for prostate cancer, uh, this is a great example, and uh, <laughs> we won't go into that, but the R is an, there's a non-coding RNA that's linked to aggressive prostate cancer, and that's the only real important type of prostate cancer that we should be concerned about. There's also now a, uh, I don't know why it's called FunSeq, because I don't know if it'd be a lot of fun, but it's a software program that's used to uh, actually uh, understand all these non-coding drivers of cancer, and over 100 of them were recently discovered. And that's actually through this type of methodology, which I won't uh, get into. But the other big technologic jump in this space is being able to sequence single cells, just like we've done with those endothelial cells that were the precursors to a heart attack. This is the case uh, actually in cancer. And so it's exciting to be able to sequence an individual cancer cell, and we're learning a lot from that as well. So now we have the ability to pick up from the blood sample the cell-free DNA and that, uh, of a tumor, and that could be remarkably predictive about uh, cancer recurrence and negate the need for very expensive and very risky PET scans, CAT scans, nuclear studies. And so almost every patient who has cancer, once they're diagnosed, has in their blood some uh, plasma tumor DNA. And so we are just at the early phases, and that may preempt this whole issue of heterogeneity, because if it's in the blood, that, must be, that may be the most important sample 
of uh, tumor DNA to direct therapy. And indeed, there are much better technologies that are now being uh, uh, developed to capture this uh, tumor cell-free uh, DNA and tumor cells. Now, just to pull this together, it's not just about understanding cancer at, in a research lab. What's really exciting is we're breaking out of the research side. And so, for example, these, this headline in the Wall Street Journal in September, patients share DNA for cures. Why is that so exciting? Because this is the first time where the, uh, the individual's DNA of a tumor and their own DNA is being put into a public database. And this is actually a joint project of uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, which is funding it, for 900 patients with liquid tumor, that is lymphoma or leukemia. And the Oregon Health Science University is doing the work along with uh, the support of Illumina and Intel. And this is really uh, exciting because the patient who's 901, who comes in with a liquid tumor, can now have the advantage of this database for uh, his or her oncologist to go into and be able to match up the sequence, treatment, demographics, outcomes, and this is, of course, what we really need. This is the beginning of an era of moons, massive open online medicine. And it's not just for cancer. It's when you have digitized human beings and you have that data that's publicly accessible. It could be de-identified, and uh, it doesn't have to be uh, an issue of identification, but just having that data with all those attributes is remarkably rich and important. So a couple other things to wrap up. Uh, one is about the fact that pharmacogenomics, Raymond mentioned that, there are so many drugs that we give today and we don't check a genotype that predicts the serious side effects or other, uh, the response of the drug even. And uh, one example of that is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. This is a potentially lethal side effect. It comes often, not so often, but uh, with, is associated with the drug uh, carbamazepine, teg Tegretol, which is a drug used for many different neurologic and neuropsychiatric conditions. And this, uh, when it occurs, one in four cases are fatal. It can be completely preempted with a genotype. And in certain countries in the world, like uh, in Taiwan and Singapore, you can't get the drug without having a genotype, but not in this country. And so this is, of course, not using the knowledge that we have. And the FDA, just last week, published a, an extraordinary report paving the way for personalized medicine. They're the ones that have been pushing for genotyping and sequencing and targeted sequencing. But the medical community has not been following the course. And there's over 106 drugs now that have a genomic label. Most of them never get assessed by the physician, and the patient doesn't know anything about it. So where are we going to go with this? How can we make this happen? One company uh, recently had a report last, a couple weeks ago that they want to have the iPhone of gene sequencing. Uh, turning point will come when sequencing goes mobile, handheld, model, decentralized, universal diagnostic tool in doctor's offices and clinics. Well, there are a couple of handheld, smartphone-like devices that can do targeted sequencing. And a lot more of that's going to happen in the times ahead. So perhaps that will be one thing when it's so uh, uh, portable, so eminently practical, that will help get this into the real world. Now, the last thing, and again, uh, it was mentioned earlier, is about the genomics of a health span. When I say health span, we're not talking about how long someone lives, but how long one can live free of any significant diseases, no chronic uh, burden of illness. And it turns out, if we were to invest in this area, this is the most efficient area of research because it transcends heart disease, cancer, because all these are late onset diseases of aging. This is a recent, uh, very interesting report from analyzing this from health affairs. So you probably have seen, uh, just uh, several weeks ago, Google announced a new company called Calico, for a California company, not too imaginative there, uh, but it, it, its, it's moonshot mission is not imaginative, that is Google versus death. And so this company is trying to understand the biology of health span. And what better way to do that through, than through uh, panoramics or sequencing. And so this article from National Geographic captured many of the individuals. We have, for the last seven years, uh, co collected 1,400 individuals who fulfill extreme health span. We call them the Welderly. And uh, they actually are pictured in various pictures from this issue. 
Uh, and you can see here, these are remarkably fit people. Their average age is 90. They range to the age of 100, up to 107. And uh, they have never been sick. They have no chronic illnesses, no uh, chronic medications. And so we sequenced now 500 of these individuals, whole genome sequence, and we have a ways to go in analyzing this data, but I think we'll hopefully get an understanding of the genomics of HealthSpan. And that can help because, for example, this mutation in the APP gene was found as a rare mutation that protects against Alzheimer's disease, one of the most important diseases of man. And the fact is it's rare, but even in people who were destined to become Alzheimer's for APOE4 homozygotes, they had totally cognitive intact, cognition was intact at the age of 98 or so. So this is something that can then lead to drug discovery programs, and that's what we really want to do to try to promote health span, understanding the biology through genomics. And so that took you through, just quickly, this timeline, which I think uh, just tries to demonstrate how much genomics uh, can really change the future of medicine. And so recently there was a cover of The Economist, a feature article about how science goes wrong. And what I'd like to submit to you is that what we're talking about this evening is about how science goes right and how it's really such an exciting time in medicine. The fact that we can now digitize human beings, and increasingly so uh, in, in the times ahead, gives us not only the uh, question of why do we need hospitals and clinics as we use them today, uh, why are we giving medications in a blinded, dumb fashion? Uh, wh how can we change the doctor-patient relationship, which Walter uh, previously touched on? And certainly we can really up the whole way we d d prevent and manage uh, diseases. And ultimately, when we have this, this information uh, available publicly for, uh, for all people with a particular condition or prevention of a condition, we can uh, democratize yeah. medicine. So let me thank you for your attention. I know the uh, time is late this evening. I appreciate uh, that you stayed uh, with me and just acknowledge a lot of my colleagues uh, at our program at the Scripps Translational Science Institute. Thank you.